I'm going to talk to you this morning. I started a series last week called Pressure Points. And the point of this series is, is just uh, the goal is to evaluate how we handle the times in life when we're put under severe pressure. And so the question is, how do we respond when life throws something at us that seems unfair, undeserved, and perhaps unplanned? What kinds of attitudes do we display? Where do our thoughts go when we're hit with the pressures of life? And, and what are the actions, uh, the behaviors that come out of us when the pressures of life really, really hit us? And, you know, there's two things that we know for sure about the pressures of life. The first thing is this, is that everyone is going to be put under pressure. You know, life is a pressure cooker. And, and if you're, if you live long enough, at some point, you're going to be put under pressure. It's not, it's not if you're going to be put under pressure. It's really more about when you're going to experience the pressures of life. And Jesus, Jesus said in John 16, 33, he warned the disciples. He said, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so the pressure is coming. The pressure is coming. And, uh, you know, you may be at a place. I know what the economy is doing in the oil industry. We have people in our church losing jobs, getting cutbacks and, and things. And, you know, there's never one thing I know is there's never a good time to lose your job. There's just never a good time. I've never heard anyone say, man, I'm, I'm so happy that I lost my job. That was just the perfect timing. You know, but we're, the truth is, is that is that the economy changes. We lose jobs. We have to re, re, uh, re-educate ourselves, get back in the workforce. The truth is, is that if you live long enough, somebody that you know and love, somebody that you trust, at some point you'll receive a betrayal. If you're a parent, if you're a parent at some time in the life of being a parent, you're going to go through some difficult times with your kids. And we have a lot of young families at our church. And I, I, w- I was thinking back, I remember when, uh, when my kids were really small and I'd be like, oh, I'd be on my knees, be fasting and praying, just trying to get them through kindergarten, you know? It's like a big life change thing right there. But how do you know that the older your kids get, the bigger the problems get? Enjoy helping them get through kindergarten. Worse is coming, you know? And, uh, so the pressures, the pressures of life and, and, uh, they're, they're, they're just gonna happen. And, you know, you may experience health problems. At some point, we're going to love some, we're going to lose somebody that we love and somebody that's dear to us. So the pressures of life are coming. Uh, it's just a matter of when. But the second point is this, is that, uh, people respond to the pressures of life differently. Some people respond in a healthy way and other people respond in a dysfunctional way, in an unhealthy way. And here's the most important thing. It is so important how you respond to the pressures of life because the pressures of life, how you respond, it determines your future. I mean, how you respond, what you do when the pressure of life comes determines how the next six months of your life are going to be. It determines how the next five years of your life are going to be. It determines how your relationship with God will be and how the relationship with your friends and family uh, will be. I was, I remember when Trace and I first got married, we were in, we were in college and, and just like, I don't know, we were just very poor. I didn't know it because we were making it, but one day I got a, a study and I said, man, we're below poverty level. That was an eye opener right there, you know, <laughs> going to school every day. And so I remember I was, you know, just on limited, limited funds. So I stopped at a, at a gas station. It was called a Circle K. And I was so hungry. I just remember I had so hungry I hadn't eaten. And I saw a sign on their window that said two hot dogs for a dollar. And so, like, I knew they weren't going to be good hot dogs. But when you're a college student, you don't care. You just want food. And so I, I had, you know, $10 for gas. But I only put $9 in because I scrounged around and found $0.07 cents for tax, you know, and I wanted those two hot dogs. So I'm going up there to buy the hot dogs. And uh, this... Around, around, uh, in San Marcos where I was going to school, there were a lot of transient people. There were a lot of homeless people living around, just traveling around. And, and, uh, so a homeless man came up to me and he looked really rough. And, uh, he said, Hey, I haven't eaten. 
I haven't eaten today. And I said, well, join the party. I haven't eaten. And he said, man, I'm so hungry. Would you help me? I said, listen, I have one dollar. I'm going to buy two hot dogs and I'll give you one of them. Hey, that's great generosity right there. That is tremendous. I need 50% of what I had away right there. And uh, so I figured, hey, if I buy him a hot dog, I at least want to talk to him. I was like, well, why, why, are, you, why are you homeless? Why are you living underneath the bridge? And you know what he says? like, I, you know, five years ago, I went through a really bad divorce. And I, I'm waiting, you know, I'm waiting. And, and as I talked to him, he was an engineer. He was a certified engineer, and he had a good life. He was married and had two kids. His wife decided to divorce him, and he just quit living. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting there thinking, like, you should be buying me a hot dog. You are, you have the ability to make a lot of money. You should be buying me a hot dog. But I, but I noticed that he got put under the pressure of life, and he decided to quit living. He decided to give up. And so instead of pushing through and, and being there for his kids and being a good father, he was living under a bridge. Hadn't seen his kids in years and years. Uh, several months ago, I heard a, a little different story. And, and it made the national news, so I'm sure that some of you heard about it. But there was a pastor who uh, he woke up one morning and he had a routine of going to the gym a 6 a.m. workout. And so he got up and he went to the gym and, and just, you know, he's getting his bag together and doing things. And he accidentally walked out the front door and didn't lock it. And if, if you heard, read the news or heard the story, uh, two criminals came in to his house and, and they, they came in and they assaulted his wife. They killed his wife. And uh, he had a two-year-old baby there at the, at the house in the, in sleeping in the room. And his wife was six months pregnant. And I just remember, it's a terrible situation. They found the people. And, uh, and several days later, he was doing an interview. And they asked him, they said, well, you know, what do you, what do you, what are you wanting to see happen? Do you want to see these two criminals? Do you want to see them get the death penalty? And he said, well, the first thing I want them to realize is that first and foremost, I forgive them for what they've done to me. I forgive them for taking my wife and, and my second child. And that's the first thing I want, I want them to know. And, you know, I was, as I heard that, I was thinking because, uh, I was in favor of the death penalty. Like, just personally, I was like, hey, and make it slow. You know, don't give them a quick shot. I mean, just, uh, you know, that's where I was thinking about this. And, but have you know, that's not the way that God would have wanted to respond. And, and certainly, He's still going to be working through this for years to come. Forgiveness is a process, but He was going in the right direction. And so how you respond when life puts the pressure on you, it determines your future. And we always, we always want to say that my situation is worse. Whatever your situation is, you can find someone that has it worse. And some people choose to respond favorably and some choose to respond uh, unfavorably in an unhealthy way. And so I was, I was thinking about my life and I was, I was thinking about some of the times that I had been put under pressure. And the one that really stood out to me was when I was 18 years old and I, I, joined, I joined the army and they flew me out to El Paso and uh, we get there. And how many of you ever been to El Paso? Several people. It is hot in El Paso. I mean, it is hot. After I finished basic training, about two years later, they they shut the they shut basic training down. In El Paso said the the weather could be detrimental to your health. Well, you didn't need to do research about that. I could have told you that. When well, you have to put gloves on so you don't burn your hands doing push-ups, it's hot. I mean, it's just hot. And so anyway, we, we get there and I re, I'll never forget this. They're marching us up on the hill to go to basic training and all your life possessions are in a duffel bag. You've been reduced to a duffel bag. And so they take us up there and there's a little quad and with buildings around it and they just leave us there. There's a hundred of us and they just leave us there. We're sitting there with our duffel bags and we're wondering what's going to happen here. And all of a sudden there's a building that we're looking at and that's evidently where the drill sergeant headquarters were. And all of a sudden, it's like a scene out of Revelation, like the dragons of hell coming out. I mean, these drill sergeants started coming out here with their little round hats on. They're hollering at people. They're cussing at people and everything in between. It's just for the next two hours. I mean, it's August in El Paso at 1 p.m. And the next two hours were just were just pandemonium. And and what was interesting was they were would gang up on people. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to put you under pressure to see how you respond. 
And you know what? It, the craziest thing, I've, one of the craziest memories I have in my life, I watched, I watched people cry. I watched people throw up. I watched people urinate on themselves. I'm sorry, it's not very uplifting this morning, but it just crazy. And so that they're kind of getting on you, and there's two pressures. They're kind of getting on you, and then they make you dump all your possessions out on the ground. So, like, everything you have, your drawers, everything, like, everyone sees everything about you. Everything you have is reduced right there. And and I remember they, they came, and they asked you trick questions, you know? Anyone ever ask you trick questions? And they asked me, you look like you're in pretty good shape, and I was. They said, are you ready for basic training? And I thought, well, if I say yes, that sounds arrogant. If I say no, that's not good either. So I told them I didn't know. <laughs> Apparently, that was the worst one. I had <laughs> six of them on me, hit me with their hats. He doesn't know. He Soldier, he doesn't know. Let's help him discuss, you know. And, and I'm just like, y'all need to just relax. Just <laughs> relax, you know. What's, get out of my face, you know. And, and then one of them, you know, they, they, then they started going on, soldier, you did not shave today. And I'm thinking, I just shaved three hours ago. I have blonde hair. Back then, I only need to shave about once every two or three weeks, you know. You did not shave today. I said, well, I did. What did you shave with? And I pulled out my razor, and it's just a little big disposable razor. And, and, and they said, you're going to kill yourself with that, aren't you? And I'm thinking, I guess I could if I really <laughs> tried, you know. It just crazy. Well, I had a brand new pair of blue Nikes, and they, one of the drill sergeants took it and threw it over to the quad next door. And said, soldier, I do not like blue. You will never wear those shoes. You have to go buy another pair of shoes. And so for seven weeks during basic training, I saw my lone shoe over there. <laughs> and they told me, soldier, you better not, you better not go get it. I better see that shoe there. And so anyway, you know, some of the people there were moved by fear and they just caved in. Some were moved by anger and they started getting mad. Others are just like, hey, it's going to pass. They just even, even killed him. I'll never forget this. The guy next to me, um, he started talking to me while this pandemonium was going on. And I'm like, man, just leave me alone. Don't, do not talk to me, you know? And he said, man, the only reason I'm here is I got caught selling drugs. And the, the, the judge told me, you can go in the military or you can go to prison. He said, man, I think I made a bad choice. <laughs> and, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not a good judge of that. I've never been to prison. But I know we're only 10 minutes into basic training. I mean, let's wait it out a little bit. He left and went all the way up to the front. And they said, soldier, what are you doing? He's like, I want a, I want a dishonorable discharge so I can go to prison. <laughs> and they said, oh, We'll give that, but not till week eight. And anyway, he's still, that guy's still in the service today. And so anyway, you know, the, the pressure, the pressures of life. And I, what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about the specific, the pressure of trials. And a trial is any affliction in your life that, that, uh, that all of your energy, all of your thinking, and all, all of your, your life basically goes into, it could be the lack of something, it could be losing a job, it could be losing a loved one, it could be relational problems, it could be emotional problems, but an, a trial is just an affliction that consumes uh, your thought and something that you would be very, very concerned about. And we're going to go to the, I'm going to the book of James, in James chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, uh, James gives us a formula for how to get through the trials of life, a very simple three-part formula. Let's read that this morning. It says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and endurance must do its complete work, so that you may be mature and complete, Lacking nothing. So in this passage, James gives us a formula, and here's the formula to gain victory of your trials. First of all, it's joy plus faith plus endurance 
equals victory. So these three things that we have to do, how do you respond when the trials of life hit you? There's three things we have to respond with. We have to find a way to be joyful. We have to find a way to continue to build our faith. We have to endure through the trial. And if we do these three things, we'll get to a place at one time, at one point or another, where we will actually gain victory and get over or through or past the trial that we're under. So let's go, let's look at this formula this morning. So number one, you must maintain your joy during the trials. And it says this, consider it great joy. My brothers, whenever you face trial, whenever you experience various trials. And so here's the thing. Joy may not be your first attitude. As a matter of fact, let's just take a poll because Todd told me this is the most honest congregation I've ever pastored. How many of you, your first response is always joy? Y'all are pretty honest. I had two. We had one, we had one person that it is. Last week I had two. So, uh, one and two with pretty, pretty honest groups of people. But here's the thing. Your first, many times our initial response, our first thing is to be angry, to be stunned, uh, to be reactionary, to be pessimistic, to be frustrated. Joy may not be your initial reaction, but it's a choice that we have to make with the strength of the Holy Spirit helping us. And so uh, here, here's the thing. If, you, if you, The root word for consider, it says, consider it great joy. That word consider, it, the root word literally means uh, to lead or to bring or to carry. So consider it great joy. The concept is this, is that whenever you're hit with the pressure, whenever you're hit with trials, you evaluate what's taking place and then you choose to, to lead, to carry that, that, that trial in the direction of God through his help. And you bring that to God and allow him to help you maintain joy in your life. Now, see, that's, that's the, 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 the proper response when we're under trials, according to James, is that we take our problem to God and we find joy in that because we know that our God is able to help us overcome every trial that we face. Amen. And so the, the joy is not because of the trial. The joy is that even in the trial, our God can help us get through it. And so the, the, now the, the dysfunctional response, the unhealthy response, is, is to go the other way and to go more into despair, depression, revenge, anger, frustration. See, the path of joy leads to God. In Nehemiah, what does he say? That the joy of the Lord will be your strength. So if we're able to channel our, our trials to God and maintain joy, we find strength. If we turn to reactionary, unhealthy ways of responding, we go away from God, we're actually falling into the devil's trap, and we actually become weak. The joy of the Lord gives us strength, and the other responses actually bring weakness into our life and take us away from God. So the very first thing that we have to do is we have to, we have to maintain our joy. The second thing we have to do is this, is that trials have the potential to build our faith. Trials have the potential to build our faith. And, and see, faith is a muscle, and it must be exercised for it to grow stronger. You know, sometimes you're walking, you're walking down or down the road, you see people, and they you can tell they put a lot of time in their bodies at the gym. And you can say, Well, how come their arms are so much bigger than mine? How come? Well, it's because they have they have exerted themselves at the gym. They have exercised their muscles and that allows them to grow. Faith is a muscle that has to be exercised for it to grow. And so uh, we hear so much about faith. We read so much about faith in the Bible. We hear so many sermons on the importance of faith. But until you actually use your faith, until you exert your faith, it is always going to be small and dormant. And so the trials of life give us the opportunity to exert our faith and turn faith from head knowledge to life application. And, and I was I was posed with a question one time. They said, hey, Terry, if you had somebody that gave their life to the Lord and let's say they didn't have to work and, you know, 
and you could just spend all the time in the world with them, teaching them how long would it take take them to get to a place of spiritual maturity. And I said, well, if you know, if you're really working hard and if you're really doing things right, I don't know, maybe five to seven years. I don't, you know, I don't know. And they said, well, you couldn't do it in six months if it's around the clock. And I said, no, because, see, you can learn the head knowledge. You can learn about faith all you want. You can hear a series on faith. But until you use the faith, until you get hit with the pressure, you hit with the trial, and you use that faith, it's going to stay as head knowledge. So the, the, the way we get stuff from the pages of the Bible, head knowledge, into our daily life application is we have to take action. We have to exert ourselves, and, and, and the trials of life allow us, allow us to do that. And so let me give you some, some examples. So if you have always struggled with finances, what I would say is this. First of all, read what the Bible says you should do with your finances, how you should handle your finances, but that's going to give you head knowledge. Once you start to apply that in your life, that's the time that you really grow. If you're struggling with your marriage, you can read what the Bible, what the Bible says, how a husband should treat his wife and how he should honor his wife and, and, and all that. But until you apply that in your life, it's just going to be, it's just going to be head knowledge. So when we apply things in our life, when we exert the principles from the Bible and we put them into our life, that is when our faith really, really, uh, begin, begins to grow. And, you know, far too many Christians, they know what they need to do, but they don't do what they know they need to do. Was that too long? I mean, there, as one person said, we're educated way above our obedience level. And, and so we have to know what. That's, that's the first thing. But then we have to apply it uh, in, into our lives. And here's the thing. God is more concerned about our, 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 our character and our spiritual maturity and getting us to a place where we can grow than he is about our comfort. He could allow us to never have a trial in our life. But if we never had a trial in our life, our faith would never grow. You know, and, and so he wants he wants our faith to grow. Let's look at what the Bible says in James chapter 2, 26. It says this, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. And the word for works there, it literally means uh, toil, Labor, effort, and action. So faith without taking action, faith without effort, faith without, without toiling it is dead. Just as if our bodies do not have a spirit, they're dead. And so faith without effort, without action, w w without toiling is dead. And then he puts it another way in verse 18 of the same chapter. He says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Of course, the words de deeds is the same word for works. So you could say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without deeds or works, and I will show you my faith by what I do. And how many of you, you hear people talk a good game, but when it gets tough in their life, they don't actually do what they tell everyone else to do. And so faith without works is dead. And so to get to the trial, if you want your faith to grow, at some point when you're up against a battle, when you're up against tough things, you have to actually step out in faith and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I, I know I don't feel like stepping out, but that's the only way that my faith, that my faith can grow. And so when you're going through a trial, you have to first maintain your joy. You have to allow the trial to build your faith. But the third thing is this, is that endurance is the key to gaining victory over our trials. And think, let's go back to our formula. It's joy plus faith plus endurance equals victory. And here's the thing. You have to have joy and faith to be able to endure. Joy and faith give you the fuel to endure. I mean, if you're de depressed and discouraged, uh, the number one thing that comes to your mind is not endurance. If you don't have any joy and you, if you don't have any joy and you don't have any faith or hope, 
I mean, you just, you just want to quit. You want things, you want things to be, to be over. That's why people are committing suicide in record numbers today. Because they have no joy and they have no hope. And as Christians, we should have both in full supply. And so it says this, go back to our text, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And so it says if we allow endurance to do its complete work, that we will be mature and complete. That's the Greek word, uh, is the Greek word is teleos, and it means just to be in a perfect state. And I know we're, you know, we're not there, but our goal is to grow to a place of great maturity and a great, and a great completeness in becoming, uh, Christ-like. Well, the word for endurance is the word that is also translated as patience. Another great question for you. How many people pray for patience? We have some brave people here this morning. Last week I told my congregation I have never prayed for patience. Now God puts me in positions where I have to anyway. You know, but I, I, I that's just, you know, that's not something in my oldest son said, Dad, I'm so proud of you. You were so honest this morning. <laughs> oh, the kids know. But right, but that's, you know, again, whether you pray for it or not, God is going to put you in positions where you have to be patient. And this word endurance, it means, it means to have a hopeful or an expectant patience. So it's not patient. It's not the thought of being patient. Well, I'm just going to take my medicine. I don't think it's going to work out. No, it's a, it's a expectant or a hopeful patience. It's like we're enduring. We're working through this. We're fighting because we know we have a hopeful expectation that God is going to deliver us, that God is going to work us, work through this, that we're going to get over it, beyond it and get through it in the name of Jesus. Endurance can also be translated as staying power. The ability to keep pushing forward uh, during difficult times. And so the key to gaining victory over the trials of life is that you have to fight through them and you have to outlast them. And here, here's the bottom line. Uh, if you, the, the, the only other alternative, if you don't endure, you quit. If you don't endure, you quit. And here's the thing. If you quit, if you quit, no one can help you. You say, well, 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 God can help. Sure he can. But here, here, here's the truth is, is that, uh, that when we endure, we actually give God something to work with. We give God something to, uh, something to, to, to help us through. Uh, but it's very hard for, for, for God to help a quitter. I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying it's much easier if you're already trying and say, God, I'm doing everything I can. Please add to what I'm doing and take me through this. And, but here's the importance of endurance because I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. I wish that I could tell you that your trial would be two weeks or two months or three months. But the reality is sometimes the trials that come to us last for a long time. So the reality is your trial may be six months. It may be three years. We don't know the duration of it. And so we have to have joy. We have to have faith and we have to have the ability to endure the ability to get up out of bed every day and put one foot in the front of the other and say, with God's help, I'm going to make it through today. I'm going to make it through tomorrow. I'm going to make it until God gives me a breakthrough over this trial. And, you know, I think, I think one of the problems is, honestly, a lot of times we're, we're naive. Okay, I'll use myself as an example. It always goes better when I use myself as an example. You know what? 17 years ago when we left here, we were... We were moving to Houston, right outside of Houston and Sugarland, and you know, we didn't have any. The only money we had was family life here was was paying my salary. We didn't have any. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any people. You need people for a church, right? We had two people that were committed, and they weren't going to church. Yeah. Great faith, and we didn't have any people. We didn't know anybody. We knew two people. I mean, besides that, everything else was going great on the church. You know, everything's just moving right along. And, and but here here's the thing it's like I th I really thought okay I'm obeying God he's going to bring people from everywhere he's going to bring them quick and you know he didn't he didn't bring people quick he brought people very slow sometimes he hit them in the bushes i mean they just were not coming very fast and and uh you know I used to tell I used to have conversations with God and one time I said God 
It would, I'm doing everything I can. It'd be very nice if you like join with me and help me. I mean, can you imagine that? I know that no one in here would ever say things like that to God. I know no one would ever do that. But the reality is for years, for seven years, we set up a daycare, we had church, we broke down the daycare. And so these three things, all of, all of my older pastor friends, I mean, Brother Francis, my dad, they're all telling me just to be happy and enjoy the ride. And I said, you got to give me something else. <laughs> you got to give me something. Come on, you know, you got to give me something else. But my whole life, I had been able to achieve anything that I wanted by working hard. And I was finally in a position where I could not do it on my own. No matter how hard I helped, I had to have God's help. And God used this thing for, for years just to shape me. And here's the thing. I had, I had to get to a place where I could be joyful if three people came, came to church. And I tell you, I failed so many times. I mean, Tracy is going to, she reward, deserves rewards in heaven for putting up with me on Sunday afternoon. She they even named it the Sunday afternoon stare after like three people came to church. You're just sitting there like, this is not what I had envisioned. The kids are like, what's wrong with daddy? And they're real small. She's like, I'll just leave him alone. It's a Sunday. It's a Sunday afternoon stare. He'll be okay tomorrow. So, but you have to be, you have to be joyful. But the, here's the second thing. You have to have faith that you're going to get through it. And if you're speaking, in my situation, if you're speaking to three people, you have to see all 50 chairs filled. You have to have faith. And faith is just believing what you can't see. Faith is the believing that God is going to deliver the what he had promised to you if you keep going. That's what faith is. So listen, in the natural, you may not see how it's going to work out today. It doesn't matter what you see. What matters is God's promises to us. God has promised that he will provide for us. God has promised that he will sustain us. God promised he would be a present help in our troubles. And so by faith, we have to look and say, no matter how it looks today, you have to get a, a spiritual revelation of where God's going to take you. And that, that will give you the energy uh, and, and the, and the inspiration to keep going. And you have to, you have to, you have to endure. And again, the only alternative, the only alternative is to quit. And so many people, so many people quit. Before I close this morning, I want to go back to the very first statement in our passage. We learned a formula for getting through, for, for uh, getting through our, our difficulties, our trials. But James starts the passage out by saying this, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, James starts with his passage on trials by, say, by saying that he was a slave or a servant to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, a, a, the word slave or servant, it's a, it's a humble title that signifies ownership by another, absolute obligation to another, or a readiness to obey the master. So before James gives this formula of having joy, having faith, having endurance to get through trials, the very first thing he says is that, hey, I am in covenant relationship with God. I'm in covenant relationship with God, and the only way I can have joy, the only way I can have faith, the only way I can endure is because it is my relationship with God. It's my relationship with Jesus Christ that sustains me and gives me the fuel uh, to do that. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? And I, I would like if we could have the, the, the prayer team to come up this morning. And, you know, we're going to open up for prayer here in a little bit. And I think it's so important. If you're here today, if you're here today and you're going through a trial and your first reaction hasn't been joy, we're going to pray with you this morning because you have to get to a place where you, where you lead your mind, will, and emotions to Christ and allow him to bring joy into your life. Maybe you're here today and one of the purposes of you going through this trial is so that you can build your faith. You'll never build, build your faith unless you have something to, uh, that presses you to really dig in and, and, and to believe God and, and, and maybe you're here today and maybe you feel like quitting. Maybe you're in a, you're in a position, uh, to where you, you have already quit. And what I would say today is, Hey, get back in the game. Let's get back in here. Let's pray for God to give you endurance. But I, again, before you can do all that, the very first thing 
in your life is have you established that relationship with Jesus Christ? And, you know, I know every, every week when I speak, when you have several hundred people in a room, there's always somebody there that maybe just had, has not yet given their life to the Lord. And that's the very first start this morning. If you're here this morning, if there's anyone here that has never given their life to the Lord and you say, man, Terry, today I want to do that. I want to do what James did. I want to be in covenant relationship with the Father God and Jesus Christ. Would you just slip your hand up this morning? We would love to pray for you. Anyone in here this morning that's never, never given your life to the Lord? I think we had one man back there that, that raised their hand for a moment. So but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you in a prayer and then the worship team is going to begin. And just uh, let's just come on up and allow, allow these men and women just to pray for you. Father God, I just pray for this, this man who raised his hand this morning, Lord. And we just, Lord, we're just so thankful in the name of Jesus that, that he was to a place where he could uh, just surrender his life to you. And so... Would you, would you just repeat after me, church, say, Dear Jesus, today I realize that I need a Savior to help me. I want you to become the Lord and Savior of my life. Please forgive me for all of my sins and all my selfishness. And I pray that you come into my life today and, and become the Lord and Savior of my life. Amen.